Hey, everybody. Welcome to It's Real with Jordan and Demi. Our guest today is, you know her, she's an icon, singer, songwriter, new album, new music coming out. Please welcome Paula Cole. Hey. Hello. Hey, Thanks Paula. How are you? I'm good. It's cold here today in Massachusetts, but I'm good. Yeah, you have the snow, the snow going on. Or now I know you're a New England person, you know, you grew up there. Um, do you enjoy the snow or after all these years you like still like you 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 kind of it drives you crazy? I like it because it feels kind of purifying and the crisp air is good on the lungs, and you kind of tend to be indoors doing more intellectual projects, and I like that. Um but you know, it's harder on the body. You get older and it's um, just, you start craving that winter trip. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel that. Yeah. Were, you, were you ever into like skiing or you ever into like say. skiing? Or snowboarding? Mm. Um, you know, God, I had such an earthy, crunchy dad. He was like a professor of biology and he would take us out for family cross country skis. Never anything exciting like downhill. I didn't do downhill till later in high school. Uh, but yeah, are you going to Black Mountain? Hmm. Would I do like what, like like Black Diamonds? Black no, diamonds. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean maybe a couple times I did in my life, but I'm I'm not like a natural skier. But I, you know, I took to it a bit. It's so fun. And I and wanted to go snowshoeing and never got the chance. I went to school in Syracuse, New York, and which is like snow everywhere. And never got to do snowshoeing. Maybe someday. <laughs> I, that's great. That's what I'm going to do. I need to get a pair of snowshoes. Yeah. If I, if I'm going to stay here then I better get a pair of snowshoes, but I do fantasize about living somewhere warmer. I have to say, I do fantasize about that. So let's get into the music. Uh, you're back in the studio. You, you are, you, you just, you obviously have recorded, you have a new album coming out in March. You've released a new single, uh, uh, green eyes crying. So what makes what's like that instinct that kicks in where you're like, okay, time to make new music and original music, not not covers. You've done some covers in the recent past. So what made you do an original album now? Uh, like therapy, maybe <laughs> going back to therapy. Like, and I'm being honest. I was kind of like avoiding my feelings for a long time and doing a lot of um, other projects, covers albums and producing a young artist, Eva James, like I've been in the studio for that. And for a while I was like writing a musical and I had like my own process kind of on the shelf. It's almost like I was avoiding my own exploration. And then I did this collaboration with um, Jason Isbell and, and John Paul White. And we gathered together in a Nashville studio and we needed a song to write, so I wrote a song, and it, I spent a lot of time with Jason's music, and I loved how vulnerable he was. It just got things flowing, that and going back to therapy, I think, and realizing, like, wow, I'm stuck. I need to unstick myself, <laughs> and uh, it all kind of came together. It's intuitive like that, and then you start writing about it, and then next thing you know, you're writing about really, like, personal feelings, and that's what happens you feel vulnerable, like, oh my gosh, this is my really inner world and I'm letting it be known. But by letting it be known, it's like you're freeing yourself. It's so great. It's, I swear, songwriting is therapy. Do you find that to be true, Demi? Do you find songwriting be, to be therapeutic for you? So weird, because I was just about to ask you, like, I feel like when you're writing lyrics, do you ever kind of have the urge to... Like, I guess when, you know, making like the final uh, thing, do you have the urge to like take it a notch back? Like, oh my God, I shouldn't say that. Or like, oh, everyone's going to know it's him. Or, you know what I mean? Or that I situation. I totally know what you mean. I totally know what you mean. Or I get, I get scared. Like there's a song there where I kind of talk about my parents and they're older and I feel vulnerable about their feelings and... Uh, yes, you know, sometimes it's taken me 15 years to put out a song about my dad, that was one. <laughs> and I went on a long walk with him and told him all the lyrics and said, I need you to be okay with this. And, Damn. He, and he said, like, I set you free, I set you free, I set you free. You know, he, I, I want to be sure I'm not hurting people. Sometimes when you write personally, it does hurt. And yes, I worry about that. And yes, I try to write in third person. You know, it's hard though. It's not my natural. 
my natural is like autobiographical, you know, bloodletting. <laughs> it is <laughs> like John Lennon, you know, I just, or Joni Mitchell, like those, they write so personally. Yeah. So, mm, it really it's is like their diary in a way. Mm -hmm. I hate that kind of writing. That's so cool. Green Eyes Crying, the kind of the lead single for this album. It's kind of eerie sounding. I love it. I love things that are kind of in a minor key. I mm -hmm. love that sort of the, you, you got some toms going on. It's not just like, you know, a snare and cymbal kit drum thing going on. So, and I feel like you've always kind of gravitated towards a sort of darker sounding, eerie sounding kind of moody songs. So what was the, I love the production on Green Eyes Crying. So tell tell us about like creating, um, and I guess the rest of the album, creating that sort of that eerie organic sound sure uh these are all my songs so it was the first time in a long time going back to 100 percent my writing which again was a trust fall and it's like the universe made it all happen like i pulled out of the musical the artist i was working with producing got sick and i just was left with oh yeah that album that i left on the shelf so we recorded in 2022 I flew to LA where a couple of my musicians lived and I wanted to work with Jay, my drummer. Like he's all over the Allison Krauss, Robert Plant and T-Bone Burnett recordings like, and he tours with them. He's uh, we've been playing together since we were 19 and I, you know, Jay's on most of my albums. Jay, I wanted to work in a place where he felt really comfortable. We worked with his favorite engineer, Michael Piersante, and we recorded in the in the village, which is this awesome studio, the B Room in the village in LA. It's where Fleetwood Mac built their studio after the success of Rumors, like before. Mm. I think Dusk was their follow up after that, and it just sounds so good. And I'm using all of my musicians that I've been working with for like decades, like. They're my brothers. We're a band. Like Paula Cole is a band. It's not me. It's I've never wanted to be Paula Cole. I wanted, I've always wanted to be a band, you know. And uh, I'm still working with people I love dearly. I I go on the road with them. So the songs were new and they were vulnerable. I just wanted it to be raw, like get it in one to three takes. Um, not uh, not like regurgitating because then it's like making shoes it gets boring and you kind of get out of your body or you're getting over analytical about it i wanted it to be raw therefore like the emotion there's emotion in the vocal you're there you're present in the work and because the work is new to the musicians too and they're such fucking beautiful musicians you know and i'm so lucky to, to work with them that they uh you know, all of us are, we worship at the altar of music, so we can kind of go in a jazz direction or rock direction, but it's live music. There's literally room mics capturing like the air molecules moving between sound sources. Like the room is an instrument too. And what we create together is like, it's a sound. And it's, those, those are live performances. So that to me explains a lot of the move, the mood and the musicians themselves are like brilliant. So, and, and I think the songs, maybe they're more simple than um, stuff I've done in the past, which is good. Like maybe simpler is better. It just allows for a more open canvas, maybe. I don't know. And I was playing guitar a little more too. And that's different. Not just at the piano all the time, like changing it up. Sometimes going to electric piano, like a, a Wurlitzer or, or a Rhodes and playing guitar and I play in weird tunings, like really low growly strings. And that's like some of the edge that you're probably detecting in green eyes crying. Yeah. It's rocking. It's more like blah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. So um, now that you know the difference now versus maybe 25 years ago is you don't have label executives breathing down your neck to produce a hit single. So do you feel just, is there a feeling just a more relaxed feeling when you record now versus like say the late nineties? Oh yeah. Oh, oh, definitely. That was always kind of terrifying. Know that knowing that the A&R guy was going to walk in on your session and everybody got a little stressed out and you'd have to play them something. And, uh, 
and it depended on how cool they were as an individual, how that went. Right. But, you know, that was a stressful thing. And um, I'm so glad to just be on my own label and to just produce myself. Um, it takes a lot of the stress out. Also, it, it's hard not to record like what's going on with, you know, with the session, but that's also highly intrusive. And I, I tried not to do that too much on this session to just allow for the humanity of being analog and being present. And um, so, uh, yeah, it's so much freer. Of course, it's hard being your own label. Like you have to be a business person and, and do a lot more work on the back end, but it's, so much more free. Yeah. And the other part of this obviously is the run up to the release, doing press like this, doing promo photos, really picking which single to release. Is that fun for you now? Um, because that pressure's off or is it still kind of stressful to anticipate how, how things will be received by your fans and, and the public? Well, I mean, if I'm with people like you who are kind and intelligent and ask great questions and it's like, it's really sweet and, and I'm honored. Um, I don't, don't get too many bad ones anymore, which is nice. Um, they just, people are generally respectful. And so it's, it's been positive so far. And also like I've been in this, I just realized today because the last interview I had, he literally held up the cassette he got from my first label, which was, it was a 30 year old cassette. <laughs> it was mailed out to him and, 1994 from my first label called Imago. And I was on, I was label mates with Amy Mann and Henry Rollins. And uh, it was like this really left of center. <clears throat> yeah. What a duo, Henry Rollins like, and Amy Mann. Wow. Yeah, it was great. Um, and you, I, that long, like 30 years, you build catalog, you build friendships and loyalties, but also like you experience like being cool or uncool or, your work seemingly mattering and seemingly not, or he, all kinds of things, backlash, um, timing. And so it's important to kind of stay like the tortoise and just stay steady and know that you're in it for the music and the therapy and the art of it. Like I'm in it so that I can die leaving good art, you know, and I'm just kind of trying to be Buddha, like let some of the adulation fall off like rain and some of the, shit fall off like rain and just keep cruising like a tortoise like just towards my end goal of great music so you seem That's like a very like spiritual like in tune like grounded like individual which is like really cool and refreshing i think like i was wondering have you always been that way or do you think it was like a path that you went on that brought you to this to this place that you're at right now Oh, if you could only see me in the morning, you wouldn't think so. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, I think like a lot of heartache makes you more real and grateful. Um, you know, like some of the things I just mentioned or living a long life and disappointment and divorce and being a single mom and moving and relocating and kind of moving back to help take care of my parents. Like these things really keep you grounded. Mm -hmm. And again, like I've, I'm an introvert. It's, it's always challenging for me to dial up and speak to strangers. And we have this commonality of the music and we're talking about that. And that's thank God. Cause otherwise I'd, I'm like the person I'm like Joni Mitchell in in people's parties, you know, that song people's parties. Like I want to just go hide like in the lampshade. I'm so introverted. I test really high as an introvert on the Myers-Briggs. Um, but I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just on my path and I'm just trying my best. And uh, there've been a lot of hard knocks. I think that just keeps you grounded. And I love music and I'm a mom, you know, I'm a mom and I have three kids. I have my daughter and I have two step kids, my son and my daughter. So all of that, like that keeps you real. I, I think in the end, it is about leaving beautiful work and, and having a long, beautiful catalog. Like That's what I aspire for. And yeah, like doing good, maybe. How can I leave my lifetime a little 
better for those behind me. <laughs> Just think about those things. Considering you, you are such an introvert, how did you handle all the attention and all the, your, the popularity when this fire came out and you had these two huge hit singles as an introvert, how did you handle it? Or did you just kind of get swept up in the moment? I didn't handle it. Well, if I look back on it, <clears throat> I was so stressed out. Um, yeah, I got like pretty mad and, and I, I was, um, I, yeah, I think it was, I handled it very poorly. I think like, I was stressed out um, and I went away. It felt like I needed to shed an ill-fitting snakeskin that I was growing out of, you know. I didn't like the career that was building itself around me. To me, I had always been more of a catalog, long-term artist, a touring artist, and I had these giant hits and I was being known for the hits and I was being lambasted for weird shit like you know having hairy armpits at the grammys and being made fun that was of ridiculous i'm old enough to remember what? i yeah. remember that and that was like a big deal i remember my mom pointed them out in your music video and like it was paula cole's hairy armpits became like a thing it was, yeah. it was it's silly now when you when you think yeah. about it. But, but at the time it was now like, actually it was yeah <laughs> You yeah. know, or I went to Europe right after it was so, it's so, like not a big deal anywhere else, but like puritanical America. But yeah, it was a big deal. And people like Jay Leno made a Paula Cole doll and shined his shoes with, with like rotating body part, like making fun of my, my body. Like that would just be really uncool now. But then that like I was taking the hit and I didn't even know I was being culturally provocative. I was just being me. I did, had never even watched the Grammys. It was like pre-digital. So um, yeah, you know, now like those small feminist statements about how you comport yourself, how you wear your hair or how you have your body or your clothes, like just torn apart three times on the show, like big laughs and a lot of backlash being cool, uncool, and being known for hits, which I hated. You know, I hated, like, I'm so much more than that. And it's still, that's still an issue for me in my life. Like, I want to be known for my art, my catalog. I'm 11 studio albums deep. I'm, I'm very strong in what I do live. Like, I'm a live performer. And um, there's just a lot more to me. So it, it was hard. I spoke to Emmylou Harris about it even, like, I wanted to leave the business and she said, Paula, just, it just happened too fast. You know, I'm really lucky. I've had this nice plateau. Um, and it's true. It happened too fast. Like my songs, they almost became part of the vernacular, it, it, which is incredible. And I don't want to ever not be grateful about that. That's profound. And it allowed the success of the singles and the songs actually allowed me kind of a seven and a half year hiatus in which I had my daughter and I raised my daughter. But coming back out of that, it was, it's not been easy. And I feel like people are starting to see me again in a new light, in a feminist light, in a light for maybe crack, making some cracks in the ceiling for us and self-producing, like being the first woman ever nominated solely for the Grammy for uh, best producer, like that kind of stuff. I didn't realize I was being radical. I didn't realize I was pushing boundaries. I was just being me and kind of clueless. <laughs> you know, I grew up in a really, really small village in the tip of an island, Cape Ann in Massachusetts, and I was just being me. I was raised like to be strong. I was like raised to be my dad's son almost, like a good camper. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I, I wasn't like aware of all these gender norms and it's just, I was just being strong and being myself. So all of that attention, yeah, it was hard. I don't think I necessarily handled it as gracefully and powerfully as I wish I had, but that takes time and wisdom. And, and I just trusted that I could leave it and reset, build catalog and kind of come back. And if people like it, okay. And if they don't, okay, I'm going to keep doing what I do. So that's like that. <laughs> We, we pride ourselves on not asking the cliche questions over and over again. But one thing I, I, I am curious about is when I don't want to wait 
got licensed to be used as a Dawson's Creek theme song. What were your ex what were you told what was going to happen and what were your expectations versus the reality of what happened when the show became popular and that became that song became associated with that show? If that right. makes sense. Uh, oh yes, it makes perfect mm -hmm. sense. Thanks. Um yeah, I don't want to wait. It had already been a number one hit on some some format like adult pop or I don't know, hot AC or something. It was already a very big tune, just like Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? Um, and some of my songs had been used for, for pilots and new television shows, movie trailers, in the movies, and they would come and go, largely. They come and go. And then the writer, Kevin Williamson, wanted to speak to me he wanted to explain his idea about this drama, this very real, raw drama about these teens. And we had a lovely conversation and I said, sure, let's give it a shot. And I, in a million years, I couldn't have predicted such a success, such a success that it, it was far more successful than Paula Cole. You know, people forgot about me and they knew the song. But the beauty of that, like all these years later, because then like people were still kind of judgy <laughs> about like mm. having music married to TV. They were still judgy. And then the small screen becomes the big screen. Then the small screen becomes where we watch our content and the next generation loves the song. And so the song, and, and that goes true for my music too. I'm finding like it's generational now. Parents played it in their homes and the kids love it. So now, I, I have like all these covers of I Don't Wanna Wait, like everywhere in hip hop, in pop, in, in like more folk artists. It, it's beautiful to see the range, like even like really kind of surfer punk pop of cowboys, like underground. It's so cool to see the breadth of how it's touched people. Um, and I, I was like, I struggled with it at first and I was in my hiatus um, and now I don't judge it as much. I just let it be. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for this multi-generational aspect of people listening to my music. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and I'm just coming out with new music that I just, I need to keep doing this. So I hope they listen to the new music because I won't stop. It's like, each album really is like a Polaroid snapshot of where you are in your life. And it's highly autobiographical. That's what it is for me. So this is just like the newest snapshot of where I am in my life and what I'm thinking. Well, one thing that's cool about the modern, you know, streaming age is that someone wants to go listen to, I don't want to wait or where all the Cowboys gone. And they're going to see the newer stuff on your Spotify. You know, so I, it becomes an outlet for that, which is, I guess, one advantage to that. But I'm sure you're not happy with the revenue sharing situation, the way Spotify and streaming is set up, because um, you've been critical of the predatory record contracts mm -hmm. in the past. So what are your thoughts about this setup where on one hand you get to access a whole new generation of listeners, but on the other hand, you're getting a third of a penny per streamer or whatever it is? Yeah, I think it's even less. Last, unless they changed that, but last I read it was point four zero point zero 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 five cents, which is like that's not a that's not a real amount of anything. Like right. you pay the bank three dollars and fifty cents for your own money out of an ATM, but you don't even pay an artist for an emotional experience for hearing music. Yeah, of course I'm critical, and um, I. That's the same man who, that created Napster, you know, who was shut down. No way. By the American courts that created Spotify. Yep. He yeah. just kind of oh my. Himself, moved to. God, Spotify. fun fact. Yeah. yeah. Demi, Demi's wheels are spinning now. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. wild. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and he did see the future. And I use Spotify. It's incredibly convenient. And I love looking up catalog. And I, I appreciate that everything's there. It's so easy. And people can find all my catalog. I like that a lot. But, you know, the monetization amounts, that needs to change. That just needs to change. Like, what kind of society are we going to be? Like, do we value the arts or do we not? 
do we value our own emotional intelligence and healing and do we care about society or not? Um, so it's just getting harder and harder to be an artist. So I think, yeah, I'm a squeaky wheel. I talk about it. The nineties contracts, even the aughts contra contracts, you know, even today's contracts, they do these 360 deals where they try to get naive young artists, grab their publishing, the masters, the touring, everything. They just try to get you when you're naive and maybe don't have proper legal representation. So, and everybody's pushing you to sign a deal because they get a cut of the advance, the, the, the bonus or whatever, they get their 20%. So actually the big signing bonus you get, like it's, you may, maybe you make 40% of that. So, and then that goes and it, all the money they spend on you, you have somehow have to, um, you know, pay off your debt, your debt with fractions of pennies of streams. So if you're talking about big nineties budgets, mm -mm. you know, they'll, they're charging you for every car service you used million dollar video shoots that, and you're supposed to pay them back now. It's with, almost like it's deductible, like a health insurance deductible or something. It's, it's like a million times worse. Mm. <laughs> it's like sharks. You're swimming with sharks. It's so, so bad. It's it's like sharecroppers. So, and the other thing I wanted to to, to talk about now, um, I remember when this happened because I was a kid when this happened. Demi was being born about the time this oh. happened. But you were you were uh, in on, on the on the little fair, the first little fair tour, the second little fair tour, um, and I was trying to articulate this to to Demi earlier. Is that it, there was a strange period in the mid '90s where female singer songwriters were almost commoditized. It was almost like um, people were, tr were signing that so you and Sarah McLaughlin and Sean Colvin and Demi's mentor, Suzanne Vega were, uh, were, you know, mm -hmm. like the, the mainstream making top 40 hits. Um, first of all, what was that period like? Did you feel like it was finally people were coming around to women singer songwriters, or did you feel like, also at the same time, you're kind of being exploited for being a woman. You know, it's kind of a weird situation. Mm. Maybe, you know, af later on the arc of that cultural happening, that was a little affair. I, I felt kind of tokenized. They started organizing us by our gender and referring to us all the time. Female, female, art, women, women, artists. Whereas, um, and that's what was happening at the beginning. That's why we made little affair in the beginning at, to begin with, uh, because you just wouldn't see two women on the on a bill, you know. Now it's more commonplace. Maybe T Taylor Swift has high um opening for her or something, right? That just right. wouldn't that wouldn't happen. That wow. wouldn't happen. Nope. That is so interesting. I feel like for as long as I can remember, prior to like just the past few years, it's just been like room for one girl, you know? Yeah. yeah. And anything. And it still swings that way. You know, sometimes it gets worse before things get better. And we realized that. Um, and I was lucky to come. My path crossed with Sarah McLaughlin. I opened for her in 95. Her her album, Fumbling Towards Ecstasy, was, um, you know, like pop and alternative hit. But not with huge singles. It was really um, organic, an organic hit. And my first album, Harbinger, was organic. And she also saw me um, on the Secret World Live. I, I did some touring with Peter Gabriel, singing with his tour. And she and her band were fans. So she invited me to open for her in 95 on her Fumbling Towards Ecstasy tour. It went fantastically well. We got on so great. And I would thank her from the stage every night. I'd, thank, I'd tell the audience, like, this is rare. You don't see a woman opening for a woman. It just doesn't happen. And I want to thank Sarah. And the, the audience would just burst out into like electrifying um, applause. And we could all feel the pulse, the zeitgeist, like this is fucked up and this needs to change. <laughs> and so we kept talking about it. And, and then we like, then like she made this pilot concert with three of us. It was Suzanne Vega, myself, um, Sarah, and we played like UC Berkeley, a couple other places. 
and it went fantastically as well. So let's try it again. And luckily she had the team behind her. She had an amazing team behind her so they could put on larger and larger shows. And then 97, she said, I, I found the name. It's Lilith after the biblical woman, you know, that was feminist and kicked out and uh, Lilith Fair. And we started there. We started there in 97 at the Gorge and it was myself and Jewel, Tracy Chapman, Suzanne Vegas, Sarah McLaughlin. And, you know, it was sold, super sold out. And that's when it was like, oh shit, something's happening here. So it's bigger than us. We just happen to be naming it. We all are very different from one another and we all are unique in our artistic expression. We're all very discreet artists. Um, and we're going to come together, yes, based on our gender, and kind of say, look how great the music is. And yes, we can sell tickets. And yes, it doesn't matter. And that's when like the media caught wind. And next thing you know, like Time Magazine was there wanting a cover shoot. All of, all of the press, and they were naming it, you know, stupid shit, <laughs> like Girls' Day or some stupid shit, you know? <laughs> like, <Little> power. <laughs> yeah, right. Totally. I'm sure they used that. And and there, was, there were ripples. Like, some people were not happy about it. But it started to change radio. There were antiquated rules on radio, like don't play two women back-to-back -back on radio, don't play... Uh, two women, even within the hour on country radio. I, I know DJs, I still do um, interviews with women in Nashville. They wouldn't play two country female artists in, the, in one day. You know, it was really That's deep, really segregated. Yep. Really deep. So we were kind of tapping at that, like, hello, this is weird. This has got to go. Let's just get together. Let's make music. Let's just be, and it was successful, so there was a narrative, and it took off. And yeah, then you become, in the second year, it's like, wow, it's even bigger. 98 was even bigger. And, and then I was out by 99. I didn't do the third year. I just needed to kind of step off that. It was getting very big and very commercial, and I just felt like it was time for me to go. Um, and, I, and that's when I started yeah, kind of going within. But Lilith Fair was an incredible experience. I feel like it was a positive cultural contribution. And those were some of the best audiences I've ever experienced, I'll be honest. Like, because it felt like we were at the crest of a wave of cultural change. Absolutely. Before, before all the shitty backlash, right? Before all the backlash, there was something fantastic. Yeah, there was a little pocket there. And I think that 96, 97, 98 era where you know, your songs and Sermon Adia and Sunny Came Home and Bitch by Meredith Brooks, these were like top 10 songs. These weren't periphery sort of underground songs. These were like what was on top 40 radio. And so I, I, I'm a guy, I'm a straight guy, but I still hold that, I still hold that, that, that time period really special to me. Absolutely. Um, and and I do feel, and I, I, we kind of downplayed, but Demi, she is close friends with Suzanne Vega and um, has kind of been mentored by Suzanne. So Demi, you want to, you want to ask him? Shout out Suzanne. No, I just got really excited just like hearing, cause I'm, I'm actually pretty sure she told me about this, this sort of festival um, sort of thing, right? Is a festival. You, would you call it a festival? Yeah. yeah a festival. Yeah. And it was like the first time. So to hear you guys both kind of talk about it in the way that you do is actually really cool. But also I'm, I'm a big fan of Tracy Chapman. Oh, and yeah. so like her song fast car kind of has been coming back i don't know if it's tiktok the cover or song or yeah yeah, yeah. Did a cover of it but um but there's so like little known about her and like her personally do you have anything to say about tracy chapman like or any memories at all i mean i i love her too i love tracy chapman's work so much and when fast car came out in 88 i remember it was the summer of 88 and I was backpacking through Europe. There wasn't a tiny shop in the corner of a nook of any country in Europe where you wouldn't hear that song coming out of a radio. Mm -hmm. It was everywhere. It transformed the world, I think. It reminded us of the importance of like the folk movement and social political justice through music, through a pop song. And, and it's just her and her guitar. She used to play in Harvard Square. 
Like I, I'm pretty sure I remember her playing in a nook, like in Harvard Square, busking, and and then it, she's on the radio everywhere. And and I, I so profoundly love that debut album so much. And yes, she's an introvert and values her privacy and doesn't want to be in the game, doesn't want to do that. And I, I really respect that. So she lives in her privacy and I'm sure she has a good life. And it was covered by a country artist, like a country male artist, um, so cool. Car. and it's a gorgeous rendition too. But I mean, she was private even then and would kind of go to her trailer and, and be in her own world. But I, I did speak a lot to the band. She killed the show, it was amazing. And Suzanne, I know even better because I would bump into her in New York in the early days. Mm -hmm. And um, we both worked with an engineer, Chad Blake. And I, I, I was a huge fan of um, Solitude Standing, her first album. No, sorry, that's her second album, but her first album was Suzanne Vega. And I saw her at the Speakeasy in New York on her first, like when she was still clubbing in New York, very articulate writer, like just doing something that nobody else was doing at the time. It was so such beautiful modern folk music. It was, it's, I hesitate to categorize it. She was just Suzanne Vega and it was stunning. And I'm, I'm happy, you know, she's still here. Uh, we share musicians and people in common. Um, that, that's beautiful to know that she's touched your life, Demi. That's cool. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Now, before we let you go, Paula, uh, we want to talk about the tour. You got a tour coming up in addition to the albums you released and the tour starts in April. So, and I know you're using a lot of the same musicians you recorded the album with. So how have you been prepping for this tour and what does a Paula Cool Paula <clears throat> Cole tour look like now compared to maybe 25 years ago? Well, it's actually like the same people, <laughs> a lot of the same people. I'm still working with my same drummer since I was 19. Um, you know, Paula Cole really is a band, so, you know, I'm, I've always wanted to be a band and my drummer is a powerful influence in my life, Jay Bellarose. He also tours with like Robert Plant and Alison Krauss and he's amazing. P other people have discovered Jay. So, um, I'll either go out as a trio or as a quartet. Sometimes I play with drums, sometimes I don't. Um, you know, I play a couple instruments, so I'm usually at an instrument. Um, it's raw, it's powerful, and it's a band. And I'm hitting the road as of April 11th. I start in Chicago, and we're promoting my new album, Low, which is just really personal. And I, I, think, it's, I think the new songs are gonna be fierce on stage. I, I was just rehearsing with my bass player yesterday and we were like, wow, these songs play themselves. This is cool. So I'm happy to introduce the new and of course we'll play some of the old. It's like, it's pretty similar to what I, what I was doing, except maybe just not for multiple thousands of people. <laughs> I'm in smaller theaters now. You, you so. like those smaller theater shows, the intimacy? Yeah. Oh yeah. And it sounds better. You know, it's more comfortable and it's, and it's uh, sounds better, but I'm happy to play anywhere, really. Yeah. Do you, what's I, one thing, I don't know why I, I thought of this last night, but when I was like prepping the interview, do you have a favorite uh, uh, foreign country to play in? What, what's your international experience? Do you have a, do you find that audiences are really enthusiastic in a certain place or? It's been a while, you know, it's been a while since I've been abroad. And that's one of our goals this year is to bring me back to the UK and Europe. Um, so, uh, gosh, I mean, Australia was amazing. And when I was there, I felt like I could live there. Uh, but I'm dying. Did you see a kangaroo? What did you say? Did you see a kangaroo? Oh yeah. Yeah. We saw, we saw. They're everywhere. They're like deer in, in, uh, in Australia. That's right. That's so cool. Anywhere you go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Sydney's so beautiful. So I'm, I'd love to go back there. And I'm also dying to get back to the UK. I want to spend more time in my life in the UK, like maybe even consider like living part time in the UK. So we'll see. Um, and, you know, France, Italy, Spain, Germany, Germany, like the audiences were so cool. 
they they would stomp their feet for encore, you know. Oh, yeah. oh, they just were like <laughs> building. Like I, I'd go back to my dressing room. I thought the gig was over, and they're still, they're still stomping, stomping their feet. feet. It's so cool. Japan, like very polite audiences, but um, they they love like all of my music, and I really appreciate that. Like even some of the lesser known work. So I mean. I can't wait to tour internationally again. I'm so looking forward to hitting the road with my magnificent musicians. And I'm so lucky to be with all these years later. I just feel really lucky to be here, you know? And thanks for having me and thanks for supporting what I do. Of course, of course, it's been great to talk to you. Uh, so we'll let you go, but thank you so much for joining us. The, the new album Low is out March 1st, I believe. And then the tour starts April 11th. So go to, I'm sure paulcole.com, I'm sure has, has all the information uh, you need. So, all right. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Thank you both. Take all care. Right. All, all right. right. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. All right. Okay. Yeah. You just go. Okay. There we go. I'm going to be honest. I feel like I've had a spiritual awakening after this podcast. What a, <laughs> what a positive light she has. No, right. for real. I yeah. feel reborn. I feel like I need to go in a room and meditate to get to her level, you know? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I bet, you know, Demi, I've, I've given you uh, you know, a hard time for, for, you know, you're, you, you weren't around for that, for that era. I was yeah. a little kid, but um, do you, I bet you enjoy hearing stories and about the way things were back then. Do you, do you like hearing kind of the talking to like those OG singer song, especially female yeah. singer songwriters? Yeah, I really, I really do. And there's also, I think, for instance, like Suzanne and Paula being a part of like that, um, that like fizzing sort of movement where it was like just for the first time women were kind of being, you know, shown some sort of like, I don't know, support in that way, especially yeah. within their own communities with like girl on girl. It's cool to like see how much they both like appreciate kind of, um, being a part of the beginning of that, right? I don't yeah. I don't feel like I hear most women like, you know, like you don't hear Cardi B talking that way about Nicki Minaj. Let's just put it that way. You feel me? <laughs> That's what I'm getting at here. Yeah, yeah, I got you. I you got know? You. Yeah. But in a way it was really fascinating also to hear about, you know, basically like how radio back then as well. Like how crazy is that? You know, how, how much the times have like changed and it's not even been yeah. that long, so. It is a, a weird, it's such a weird thing how, you know, when Paula was coming up, album sales were everything, selling physical CDs were everything and how it's changed. And I don't know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to kind of pick which one would be better, the, the streaming era or the, you have to felt, sell physical CDs era. So I don't know. It's why. Where do you think it's heading, Jordan, is the question. I don't know. I don't Crazy know. I, I, I do. On one hand, I like my, relatively inexpensive Spotify subscription, but there's part of me like, you know, like, man, if we, if, if we got paid, if artists got paid even just a single penny per stream, mm. it would be fair. But at the same time, it's like weird. You can also hit the lottery where if you get, um, you know, a hundred million streams that, would give you more profit than if you sold a certain amount of singles back in the nineties, but you have to get to such a high level to get to that point that I think it's hard for you could be a, an, a, a high level indie artist, you know, like Suzanne, like Paula Cole uh, before they broke into the mainstream and still make a living. And now I feel like it's hard to make a living unless you're getting hits. And that's why I feel like, not to get on my, I'm getting Being my like, thoughts like here. Going into commercial I, I music, like, huh? Making, like going into like the more commercial route. Is what you're right, saying. you have to get, and and you've experienced this with your own with your own music. Is that you feel like you have to make something that people will do TikTok Digest, digestible. Will, yeah, yeah. It also comes down to just like because of the internet and like music being more accessible and music making me being more accessible it's like it's just more saturated so that kind of yeah. like explains kind of like why absolutely you're that's on that piece, correct yeah. you do there's this pressure to both be unique and also fit in at the same time like when you make a song you like want it to sound totally different than everything else so you stand out but also you need it to be a certain formula to catch on so yeah we're living in a world of analytics 
and we we just have to deal with it, I guess. Let's just all be robots. Let's just all be robots. And We're heading that way. Natural. We're heading that way. Yeah. All right. Uh, that's in this. We just got really nerdy. For watching slash listening to It's Real with Jordan and Demi. As always, go to popdust.com for the latest in pop culture and music news. Follow me on Instagram at Jordan Edward Studio. Follow Demi at Demi underscore Ramos. And yeah, we'll see you next time. Bye.